Good morning. Welcome to worship on this Lord's Day. It is always such a joy to be gathered as God's people. And today, Palm Sunday, is one of those great and wonderful joys that we have. Uh, if you did not receive palms on the way in, feel free to go get one from the ushers. Uh, we will process with palms during the first hymn. And, uh, you know, we're in, a, we're in a new world. Post-COVID, we look back and we say, how did we do that before? Now, how do we do it now? Because we have a camera in the room. Um, and we want to include those who worship with us online. Uh, so, when during that first hymn, we're going to sing it through twice. Uh, Victoria and I will go to the back so that we can lead people forward. And then you can just fill in behind us. Come on down and we'll place our, our palms on the ground in front of the uh, in front of the communion table. So that's how the procession will go. Uh, you notice our butterflies are in the room with us, and uh, they got ready a little faster than I thought they were going to, so we're going to have to let those go with the children after worship today uh, in anticipation for Easter as it comes. Um, also, I wanted to acknowledge the, uh, the art is complete in our Narthex Art Gallery, where we've been reflecting on the uh, six great ends of the church. There are some uh, inserts that have been provided, and there are additional ones in the back in case there is a piece that you weren't aware of. Uh, and that'll be up for a while as we move forward through Easter as well. Um, let's see, the study that we're doing on the great ends of the church, apparently the scriptures were not updated on that, and you should know that that study is intended to be, this week's study, is intended to be based on the same passages that we are using in worship today. So the group, we, the Sunday school group this morning caught it for you, and moving forward with um, the Monday group and others, uh, the texts that we have today are the ones that were intended for the study uh, that is on the, this last lesson for the great ends. Also, we have Holy Week coming up, which means uh, Monday Thursday will be our um, Eucharistic feast. It's a time of celebration where we get together and we uh, consider the commandment of, of Jesus to love as we have been loved and what exactly that means, how Jesus loved us and how we might respond as we prepare for Good Friday and then also Easter. So we'll have the Monday Thursday service, which is a dinner church, and there will be a sign up out uh, in the and after church for that, uh, for a few items that are still needed. But otherwise, just come at 530, and you may have a few th things to do to help us get set up. That's part of the, the deal with that. It's a community celebration. So come on Monday Thursday at 530, and we'll enjoy that meal together in remembrance of Christ. Then on Friday at 5.30, we will again have a service in here. It'll be a brief, reflective service that considers uh, the severity of the cross and how good it is that, uh, that God loves us that much. One more thing about Easter that's coming up. Uh, there's an insert for Easter lilies. There's something that was posted online also about an opportunity for giving online to, uh, to provide Easter lilies during Easter. Uh, one of our members thoughtfully considered that you might need a paper clip to put your uh, whatever donation you want to go for the lilies with your little piece of paper, because sometimes those get separated in the plate. So I'll repeat that again when we get to the offering, but just wanted to make sure you knew that's what the paper clips were for back there. So lots going on in the life of the church. The newsletter has come out, and there's more to see in that about Earth Day activities, the garden event that I'll mention again later, and I uh, want to make sure that you know that that information is out there. And if you didn't get one, contact the church office and we'll make sure that, that you get it. Otherwise, watch us on social media and let's uh, keep up with each other and encourage one another as we move into Holy Week together. So again, this week we've got Maundy Thursday at 5.30, Good Friday at 5.30, and then the Easter celebration as well. There's one more announcement that needs to be made. Chuck, can you again correct us on the matching fund and maybe share a thought or two on that? I'll get an email at weird times, like uh, a couple of weeks ago in church. <laughs> but we're uh, the matching um, the matching challenge is actually doing very well. We are between seventy five hundred and eight thousand dollars for our our match. Um, we have one week left to go, so uh, reach out to people who uh, who aren't necessarily regulars or people maybe who 
consider this their home church, but they've moved on. I've talked to both of my daughters, and uh, something came through from one of them last night. <laughs> so it's, it's just one of those things that we're looking to try and uh, get it complete there by Easter. Uh, we're over three-quarters of the way there. So it's, uh, th this, is, this has moved me a lot because somebody back in January mentioned the possibility of doing this. I casually mentioned it to Zach with the thought that we could plan something. And the next thing I know, Zach says, why don't we do it for Lent? And it, it took on a life of its own. And it really, it really touches me. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Chuck. Uh, again, the matching fund is for gifts that are above and beyond the, uh, your normal giving, your normal pledged giving. And it is encouraging. I hope you are encouraged to know that there is so much love in this congregation for this congregation and for the ministry that we are all a part of. So uh, we'll again remind you of that when we get to the time of the offering. But thanks be to God for those who have already participated and for the opportunity to invite others into that challenge. Let us now prepare our hearts and minds to worship God with all that we have and all that we are right here, right now, as God's people together. Freedom is coming, freedom is coming, freedom is coming, oh yes I know. Freedom is coming, freedom is coming, freedom is coming, oh yes I know. Freedom, freedom is coming, freedom, freedom is coming, freedom is coming, oh yes I know. Freedom, freedom is coming, freedom is coming. Freedom is coming, oh yes I know. Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming, oh yes I know. Jesus, Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming, oh yes I know. Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming, oh yes I know. Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming, oh yes I know, 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 oh yes I know. Oh yes I know, oh yes I know, oh yes 
Please rise, in body or in spirit, and join me in the call to worship. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. The Lord is God, and God has given us light. Bind the festal procession with branches up to the horns of the altar. Give thanks and glory to God. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for God is good, for God's steadfast love endures forever. Let us worship the Lord. had some clapping in the Presbyterian Church. <laughs> Who says we're frozen chosen? The Holy Spirit can move. Friends, hear the waters of baptism and be mindful of God's never failing commitment to love you always, no matter what. God's love draws us to confession. And so just as we have placed palms in expectation of the triumphal entry of Jesus, let us lay down the facade of self-reliance as though we were made to exist all alone. Let us confess the sins that we bear and share with the confidence of a child returning to the embrace of a parent who loves them unconditionally, yet not without accountability. Let us pray together and then also silently and personally. Eternal God, you have called us out of darkness into your marvelous light. Help us to face the darkness in our lives. We confess that we are often timid and fearful when we should share your love with others. At times we are silent when we should speak. Remind us again that we have been called into the great company of your church throughout the world, the faithful in many nations who witness to your grace and goodness, even at the risk of discrimination, persecution, and death. Forgive our neglect in praying for those who bear costly witness. Help us to live in your light and walk in your ways. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. 
Hear us now, O God, as we offer silent personal prayers of confession before you. Amen. Beloved of God, know this. No matter what you have done, whatever has been done to you, God's love is for you, and you are forgiven. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> At this time, I invite the younger disciples to join me down front. All right, welcome. So, a couple things. Uh, we have these fish banks. You guys don't know about that because you're visiting with us today. Haven't seen them before. Do you guys remember the fish banks? Yeah? Okay. Do, do you know what they're for? No? Okay. They're for helping people. That's the easy, simple answer. <laughs> but uh, this is going to be something that we bring back on Easter. So you guys handed these, some of you guys handed these out to the congregation. And that's, that's some money in there. So people ho hopefully have been uh, saving some money that they can use to help people. This is for one great hour of sharing, which helps people in disaster, like a tornado or a hurricane or something like that. And it also helps people who are hungry, because there are some programs that feed people, and it helps people who want to help themselves when they don't have the stuff they need, but somebody needs to just help them get started. So that's what that's for. So I just want to remind you for that, okay? We also have our, our butterflies up here. We've been watching them grow, and um, they, you know, butterflies don't live as long as people do. We need to make sure they get some sunshine and enjoy some flowers. So we're going to let these guys go, both of them, after church. So um, if you go with Ms. Dorinda, then maybe when you come back, if you guys can, can work together to get these little butterfly tents outside, and, uh, and then we can let them go together. Sound like a good plan? Awesome. Okay. All right. So I had something else I wanted to ask you all about. The palms. Did you enjoy waving the palms and going down front? Was that fun? Yeah? Maybe? You're just saying yes because you're in church and it's the right thing to say? <laughs> Was it weird? A little bit? A little bit weird? Okay. Maybe. Maybe not for you guys. Do you all do that at your church at home? No? Okay. Well, anyway. So the palms. The reason why we do the palms is because there's a story in the Bible about Jesus. And he's riding a donkey. And the road's pretty bad. Like, worse than Louisiana roads, okay? And there's holes and rocks and things like that. And people don't want the don donkey to stumble because they don't want Jesus to get hurt, right? And so they lay down, like, their coat that's weird. Can you imagine a donkey walking on your coat? No. And palms and all this stuff because they want Jesus to be okay. Because they want Jesus to know how much, how important he is. So when we put the palms down, it's we're remembering that story. And we're also remembering how important Jesus is to us. And that was the main thing I wanted you to think about today. All right? Cool. How about we stand? We'll say a prayer. You guys can repeat after me if you want to. Hi, God. It's us. We love you. Thank you for palms and for Jesus and the way he teaches us how to love. 
Amen. All right, so y'all can go with Miss Dorinda if you want, or back to your families. Either way. Calm us now, O Lord, into a quietness that heals and listens. Open wounded hearts to the balm of your word. Enter into our hearts once again as we center our lives around your word as it is proclaimed. Amen. Our first reading is from Isaiah chapter 50, verses 4 through 9a, which can be found on page 681 of the Old Testament in your pew Bible if you'd like to read along. This portion was written to encourage the people of Israel during a time of captivity. But it's hard for us to hear it without considering the suffering of Jesus. Listen now to Isaiah chapter 50 verses 4 through 9a as a people who have been freed from sin through the love of God. The Lord God has given me the tongue of a teacher that I may know how to sustain the weary with a word. Morning by morning he wakens wakens my ear, to listen as those who are taught. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious. I did not turn backwards. I gave my back to those who struck me, and my cheeks to those who pulled out the beard. I did not hide my face from insult and spitting. The Lord God helps me. Therefore, I have not been disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up together. Who are my adversaries? Let them confront me. It is the Lord God who helps me, who will declare me guilty. All of them will wear out like a garment. The moth will eat them up. Here ends the first reading of God's holy word. Our Second Testament reading comes from Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11, and you can find it on page 197 of your New Testament if you'd like to read along. This passage is considered by many to be one of the oldest statements of faith in the Christian tradition. Listen for what the Spirit, uh, the movement of the Spirit in Philippians 2, 5 through 11. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord to the glory of God the Father. Here ends the second reading. Our gospel lesson comes from Matthew 21, 1 through 11. You can find that on page 23 of the New Testament in your pew Bible if you would like to read along. This is the story that I mentioned to the children earlier, the story of the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. Here now, the word of God as it comes to us from Matthew 21, 1 through 11. When they had come near Jerusalem and reached Bethpage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you. And immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, the Lord needs them. And he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet, saying, tell the daughter of Zion, look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus directed them. 
They brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks, cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from trees and spread them on the road. The crowds went ahead of him and followed, were shouting, Hosanna this to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, Who is this? The crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, congratulations, church. We've made it to Palm Sunday. This is, of course, a time of great moral dilemma. You see, there are those that argue that Lent goes all the way up until Easter, and technically it does. However, if Ash Wednesday is when it started, February 22nd, and it lasts 40 days, well, that means your fasting or whatever spiritual discipline you picked up would end today. Now, of course, the point here is not to check off a bunch of dates and argue about which ones count and which ones don't count, but instead to prepare our hearts and minds and, the, and all that we have and all that we are for the newness of life that we celebrate on Easter Sunday. If your Lenten disciplines are helping you with that, then forget about the math and just focus on faith. I mean, you can even keep doing them after Easter if you want to. Now, I realize that every day offers the hope of the second and third and 52nd chance, but there is something special about Easter, and it is worth waiting and preparing for. And one of the ways that we do that is celebrating Palm Sunday with a procession of palms in memory of the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. Our New Testament texts tell this story from Matthew's perspective and also include a recognition from some of the earliest followers of the way of Jesus that Jesus knew he was heading toward the cross. In our Old Testament reading, we have the prophetic claim of Isaiah describing a servant of God who will stand firm in the face of the worst that the world can offer. Now, before we get too much further into all that, I want to remind you that during this season of Lent, we have been exploring the six great ends or purposes of the church as informed by Scripture. And today we're considering how these texts help us to exhibit or be a demonstration of the kingdom of God. Well, this is the last of the six great ends, and... While I don't think that God cares if you can quote them as much as whether or not we are doing them, I do want to try to keep a sense of the whole in our minds because they're, they're part of a whole picture. Now that said, today's recap of the six great ends of the church will be inspired by, not the tune actually, but inspired by the nursery rhyme, There Was an Old Lady Who Swallowed a Fly. Jake, can you, can you help me? There once was a church that had six great ends, thus to exhibit the kingdom of God. This is the way. Proclaim the gospel to save humankind, thus to exhibit the kingdom of God. This is the way. Since we are saved, we shelter God's children, thus to exhibit the kingdom of God. This is the way. We shelter the children in body and soul by letting them know they are part of the whole. This is the way. As part of the whole, we glorify God in everything we do and we say, this is the way. We glorify God through relationships, caring for all creation as God's, this is the way. In caring for all, we make a way that everyone knows God's will and God's way, this is the way. There once was a church that had six great ends, thus to exhibit the kingdom of God. Big finish. And this is the way. Thank you, Jake. Uh, apparently, I was, I was, you know, it would have been funnier if like one person clapped. <laughs> well, I hope that was at least entertaining and maybe logged a couple of those things in your mind from the previous weeks that we've been talking about these things. Now, to say that the church is supposed to exhibit the kingdom of God, whew, that may sound a little pretentious. And maybe it is if we expect or assume that we are doing that. We are exhibiting the kingdom of God just because we're here. 
or because of a program or a statement or a creed or something we say. In fact, every Sunday we say, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But do we really think about what that looks like and what that might require of us? I will confess that I have said it a time or two out of reflex and habit, and I imagine we all have. Rituals and repetition are not a bad thing, but as it has been said by many others, an unexamined faith is not worth having. Now that's based on a quote from Socrates, which was further modified by a guy named James Adams Luther of Harvard Divinity, to say an unexamined faith can only be true by accident. A faith worth having is a faith worth discussing and testing. Now, ideally, that's what we've been doing in the season of Lent, examining and testing our faith. And as far as the six great ends go, I like to think of exhibiting the kingdom of God as kind of like a summary statement. Just like the first one, proclamation of the gospel for the salvation of humankind, that was a foundational statement. Everything else talked about how we live out that salvation. This one shows the result of all of that together. If we are living into our salvation, we care for ourselves and others and all of God's creation in such a way that people get a glimpse of what it might be like for God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. Not only that, I think that that is exactly what those who lay down their cloaks, God, it gets me every year, the cloaks on the ground. Wash day was horrible. And the palms, they laid these things down because they thought they were exhibiting the kingdom of God. They thought they were doing something that would usher in God's kingdom. They believed that Jesus would be the one to save them from the empire of Rome and restore them as a nation. They believed that God had chosen this man to disrupt the forces of empire that had corrupted and crippled them for so long. And then the first thing Jesus did was to turn over tables in the Senate. What? No. Wait, that's, <laughs> that's not right. Let's see. Matthew, Matthew 21, 12 through 14. Then Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who were selling and buying in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. He said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer. But you are making it a den of robbers. The blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he cured them. Healing follows Jesus' wake. That seems to be the way in Matthew's gospel. Now, don't get me wrong about the crowd. It's easy to judge them and to talk about how quickly they turn from Hosanna to crucify. But the reality is that in both cases, when they were shouting Hosanna and when they were shouting crucify, they believed they were doing what they were doing to honor God. The problem is that they, as we so often hear in John's gospel, were focused on earthly things rather than heavenly things. And Matthew's gospel is certainly concerned with heavenly things, but the author is particularly concerned, especially in this passage, with demonstrating that Jesus is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. That's important, and we talked about that uh, on February 6th, actually, if you want to go back and look at the blog or go back and look at the YouTube channel, and you can see that. But today, what I'd like to focus on are verses 10 and 11. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, who is this? And the crowds were saying, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. Now the whole city included the Romans, it included the Jews and Gentiles, and, and many scholars agree that it was likely that this impromptu parade of Jesus was kind of a counter-protest to the parade of Pontius Pilate. He would have entered another gate in the city and there would have been a military parade with him to show force during the Passover. The text doesn't say it, but I love the thought of Pilate having a low turnout for his parade and finding out that Jesus had better ratings on the parade circuit. Now regardless, there was a fair amount of confusion and I'm reminded of a friend who's new to Louisiana who was telling me about getting stuck in traffic at a St. Patrick's Day parade. She said, you know, wasn't Mardi Gras enough? I, don't, I didn't think there were any more parades during Lent, but no, I have to get stuck in a St. Patrick's Day parade. Maybe that was the attitude of some of the locals in Jerusalem, maybe it wasn't. What we know is that in the midst of all of it, their anxiety, their confusion, their hope, all of it, the people, as it says in the text, 
still had an expectation that Jesus was someone who spoke truth to power and who acted as a mouthpiece for God. I wonder, if, if we are the body of Christ, I wonder what people say when they see the church today. And I don't just mean this congregation or this building, I mean the church. I mean all who profess to follow the way of Jesus and all who actually do. I mean the institutional church and the informal church. I mean all of it, the body of Christ here on earth today. Now chances are that what I have described offers more of a cacophony than a proclamation. So I wonder how we get around that. I think the text can help us once again. In Philippians it said, Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. I tell you, you want to know how you have shown me what that looks like, what it means to have the same mind of Christ, how we can be an exhibition of the kingdom of heaven, how we can live in a way that God's will is done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, you have shown me that in this congregation. You've shown me it through humility and faith and compassion that can embrace and welcome and celebrate those that others cast aside. You have told me about a legacy of faith in this congregation that was well before I was here that includes caring for children in our community, uh, forging peace in Belfast through the Ulster Project, caring for the vulnerable during the AIDS crisis, and starting, establishing, and housing partner organizations that are still active in this city, caring for people today. You've shown me what it means to have the mind of Christ by working together to rebuild this community after countless storms, showing compassion for the grieving and re resilience for those who needed hope during COVID was another way, and relying on the connectivity of the church, being that connectional church that we preach about so that we can provide clean, safe drinking water for the people in Sabania, Cuba. We could not have done that on our own. We did that because we are a part of something greater than ourselves. And we still do it to this day. Friends, what I'm trying to say is that I think we know why we wave these palms. And it is good and right that we do it. We know that Jesus enters in triumph every time the church aligns itself with the cause of Christ. We also know that this will put us at odds with the structures of empire that exist in the world today. We know that the procession of palms leads to the cross, but before that, it takes us here to the temple and demands that we clear out all pretension and any expectation that this religion of ours is to benefit us alone. Now, that's not to say it's not to our benefit. It's just not a secret possession. This faith we share and examine and stand upon is a gift to be given and shared. In that way, as the body of Christ, we can move confidently toward the cross, knowing that it stands to remove our hesitation to love as we have been loved. So let the procession continue as we move through the holiness of this week in the hope that we may not only get a glimpse of the kingdom of God, but we might be a glimpse of the kingdom of God for someone else. At least I pray that it may be so with me and with you. And I know that it happens more frequently when we do it together. All of this to the glory of God, now and always. Amen.
As we stand, let us affirm the faith we share. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. At this time, we turn to the Lord in prayer. I believe I may have left that out of the bulletin, so there may be some confusion in the room. But this is a time when we share our joys and thanksgivings and also burdens we bear together with God. Uh, I want to share with you some uh, community notes first. One is to tell you that I talked to Sonny uh, Branch this morning about uh, Dan. He is still in the hospital and uh, has not made a whole lot of progress, so they ask for your prayers for that. Um, her daughter-in-law is in town from Atlanta and is providing a lot of extra support in addition to her other children who live here in the community as well. Um, so she appreciates your prayers uh, as they work towards Dan's recovery. Uh, also, yesterday was, and Friday too, was a great day of uh, action in the church. There was a lot of work that was done inside and out uh, in terms of shrubs and cleaning out old closets and all kinds of things, materials going to the restore so that we could continue legacy and help people and those kinds of things. Um, so a lot of hard work. Carol, you said how many people, 15, 16 people? Yeah. Thanks be to God for all those folks who were here over the weekend working so hard. Um, also, uh, Nell and I went to Baton Rouge to celebrate with George, um, what is George's last name? Strain, who is a member of our Cuba uh, team. He's the person who has been our engineer on our um, Cuba projects, and that was a great celebration for him. It was his retirement from teaching at LSU, uh, so that was a, a great celebration. There were folks from the University Presbyterian Church there, too, so it was just a nice connection to make between our, our congregations. Um, I did also want to let you know that in Cuba, we need to be in prayer for our, our friends there because the pastor who has been the pastor of that church has uh, moved on and it appears that he may be in Costa Rica now, um, so probably not going to be back in Cuba. Uh, so Josue Montejo is a pastor there who, is, um, who, who has been connected with the various projects and he's pastoring three congregations right now because uh, he's stepping in for Sabania. There's another congregation where uh, one of the people that we saw grow up into ministry through this program um, is struggling with, with cancer and uh, in the, is unable to serve. So um, now, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting her name. The, what, Susanna, yeah. So prayers for Susanna as she recovers from cancer or battles it. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. For those who are worshiping online, Nell is telling everybody that uh, Josue sent us a picture of the uh, sanctuary in Sabania, all decked out with palms. And so it's very affirming to know. <laughs> so we'll be sharing those pictures back and forth, and uh, we'll see if we can maybe email some of those pictures to the church and post them on Facebook as well. Um, so there's lots, lots of things to celebrate and know about. Um, one other thing I wanted to lift up that's a community thing, um, one of our partnerships with Family Promise is annually a, a garden celebration, Southern, the Southern Garden fellow Celebration, and um, Jordan will be out front to, uh, if, to, if there's anybody who wants to volunteer to help with that or be a part of it, but it's a, uh, a local celebration that um, supports Family Promise and uh, a, great, a great time. It's a lot of fun. That will be on Earth Day. Um, and there are other things that are Earth Day celebrations we'll mention coming up in, in the coming weeks. Uh, so uh, any other people to be praying about or situations or events or things that we want to lift up in prayer? Yes. Wonderful. Uh -huh. 
For those who are worshiping with us online, Chris was thanking us for praying for her daughter who had, uh, there were some complications for her pregnancy and everything went beautifully. So, and you also had a, a wedding. We had a wedding last week too, so yeah. Uh-huh. That was very fun. Your, the, the, your son? Daniel, yeah. Daniel got married? Okay. Well, we're glad that you're back and uh, glad that you had a joyful celebration. Yes. I'm going to summarize that for people who are online, so forgive me if I leave anything out, but Claire is, is saying because of this faith that we share, because of this call to exhibit the kingdom of God, uh, that there are those who are suffering, particularly in the LGBTQ plus community, laws that are going on around the country, and uh, issues of visibility in terms of materials at libraries, and uh, that there is a great risk that people will, um, will die from uh, suicide and from other things. So, uh, and, and from violence exacted against them. So, yeah. So we must be in prayer for those who suffer and uh, find ways to be compassionate and advocate where we, where we feel called to. Okay. Um, all these things in mind, unless there are any other prayers. Gratitude for a great student art expo in the community. So glad that you had that opportunity and that they did. All right. Let's come to the Lord in prayer. God, there is so much that we come to you. There is so much that's going on in the world. Uh, it can be overwhelming. It can make us say, who is this person? Who is this Jesus? And what does he have to do with it? Lord God, we know that you are at the heart of it, that you are... Uh, the one who gives us our understanding and direction for how to love. And so in the name of Christ, we pray about those things that are essential and important by praying as he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now we take a time of offering, of self-offering, where we consider God's grace and mercy in our lives and how we might respond. Uh, I do want to remind you, as was stated earlier, about the matching fund. Uh, we're coming to the close of that time where that matching fund is available. So those who feel called to be a part of that, you are encouraged to do so. Uh, also, uh, if you are leaving a donation for the Easter lilies and you want to make sure that that donation stays with your little uh, insert, there are some paper clips back there you can use when you're putting that in the plate at the end of the service. Um, and those things can be done online as well. Uh, take this time then to consider God's grace and mercy in your life and how we might respond with commitments of the heart, with the days that we've been given, with the community that we are as God's people together.
Join me now in our prayer of commitment. Gracious God, giver of all gifts, hear us now as we shout Hosanna. Hear us as we commit our lives and our resources to your glory through simple acts of kindness, shared acts of mercy, and expressions of hope that demonstrate the kingdom that is present and yet to be revealed. Amen. the charge and benediction, I want to remind you that there are sign-ups outside for Monday, Thursday, and also for the uh, Garden Festival. Now receive the charge and benediction. As we move through this week, let it be a holy time. Let us make use of this time to reflect on the severity of the cross as we prepare to celebrate the empty tomb and the hope of the resurrection. And go in peace as God's beloved. Amen. Oh.